So, two weeks ago, I preached a message called The Makings of the Mighty. How many of y'all were here for that or you saw it online? Okay. If you didn't, go watch it online. It was, it was pretty. Did you like it, Tracy? It was good. It was good. She texted me yesterday. I'm watching it right now. Praise God. I'm, and this week, we're going to go into part two. <laughs> and the title for today is Maturing in Purpose. It's The Makings of the Mighty, part two. We're, we're picking up. Actually, we're not picking up where we left off. We're building on a foundation. Amen. And so, yeah, the makings of the mighty, uh, mighty, that was two weeks ago. And last week, Eric has shared on answering the shepherd's call, very powerful word. But two weeks ago, we're looking at the uh, transformation of Elisha, or Elisha, however you want to pronounce it, amen. I think he's Elisha today, hallelujah. But we looked at his journey from secular might. He was a, he was a wealthy man. He, was, he had 12 teams of oxen, and he was working that last team. And, 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 and they came, and they cast a mantle upon him and called him into a sonship with Elijah. And then we watched his transformation from being a man of secular might to being mighty in spirit. Amen. And so we, likewise, we're making this journey. We've been called by the King of glory. Hallelujah. And we've been called into his marvelous light. In our worship time, there's a couple of lines there that had talked about bringing light into the darkness. And, and there's something amazing when you can look at that in terms of the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God is a light that comes into the darkness and pushes darkness away. When we realize that, that yes, Jesus Christ is the Lord, and he is a good shepherd, and, and, and he is a, a, a redeemer, and he is a, a restorer, and he's restoring his kingdom, hallelujah, he is a conquering king. And he is conquering every other kingdom. Every kingdom will submit to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. And sometimes what we have to do is we have to be able to realize and see our own lives as the kingdom of God. Because there's certain darkness in our own lives. Because we were, we were born with a sin nature. Because we're coming out of the world and into His glory. That there are kingdoms within that need to be conquered. One thing after another after another. Until we all come together to the fullness of the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so you are being transformed. You're being made new. That, 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 that the yesterday's mistakes are not your tomorrow. Hallelujah. But you're being called up into something greater. Amen. And so today, be greater today than you were yesterday. Amen. Whatever you do, just be greater. Hallelujah. Amen. Just be better at it. Amen. Today, I want to go a little further uh, in, in investigating the making of the mighty. A little bit more uh, deeper. How, how do we get from glory to glory? How do we get from might to might? How do we grow up into all things into Christ Jesus? How do we move from being a small child to being a young man to being a father? How do we actually make these transformations? Amen. And so we're, we're called to walk in a level of kingdom authority, of kingdom might. No matter where we are in faith, if we're in faith, we're moving with some level of grace, some level of of power. We may not even be realizing it. Maybe not walking it out because we don't realize what it is that we have access to. But I'll tell you right now, you have access to things that are greater than anything in this world. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. And greater are you in him than you are without him. Praise God. So we're taking these steps forward. I want to take a look at the making of some mighty men. Hallelujah. So starting in Matthew 10, verse 1, it says, and when he called, when Jesus had called his 12 disciples to him, he, get, listen, he gave them power. I could stop right there. He called the 12 unto himself and he gave them power over unclean spirits. Say that with me. He gave them power, gave them power. Over, unclean over unclean spirits. Underline that in your Bible. Write it down. We're going to come back to that because that's a, that's a significant thing that sometimes we skip over. We think about, oh yeah, they just cast out devils and everything. No, he gave them power yeah. over unclean spirits to cast them out. Not to play games with them. Not to hang out with them. But to cast them out. Yes. I love your offering message. It's speaking to me now more while I am preaching than when I was sitting. Because she spoke to unclean spirits and she cast them out. Took them out from power. She locked the door behind them and she reminds them on a regular basis. No. Two feet, four feet, eight feet. Get back. Get out. Oh no, hallelujah. My God, where was I? Cast them out. And to heal all kinds of sickness. What kind of sickness? What kind was not they have power over? None. But he gave them 
the power to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. That's Jesus. That's the anointing that was set upon Christ himself. And now, think about this. He now issues them power to do what he does. What happened in that moment? What happened in that time? I'm not saying all that happened in a minute. But what happened during that process? This is what happened. He gave them the kingdom. He gave them authority in his kingdom or of his kingdom over all things unclean, over all sickness and all manner of disease. He gave that to them. Amen. So then he sends them out. Jump down to verse 7. And so he says, as he sends them out, and as you go, he says, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So in other words, he's saying, something's about to change around here. Amen. He says, heal the sick. Here's the commandment. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Now watch this. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you've received what? The kingdom. Now freely give the kingdom. I'm going to believe, and you can say in honest faith, I believe the kingdom of God is within me. Now freely you have received. So you freely give out the kingdom. So... He gave them power, and, and you can write that word down, power. Power to perform the works of Christ. He's spoken directly to them. So in other words, he didn't send them out with no power. He didn't send them out and say, see what happens. He said, walk out with some authority. Walk out knowing what you're doing. Verse 9, watch this, let's get some principles down. He says, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs. For a worker is worthy of his food. Do you see a power in that? Here's, a, here's, another, here's, a, here's another power that wasn't explicitly said. It's the power of provision. As you go, trust. As you step out in the things of God, trust. There is a power of provision. Has God provided for you lately? Oh, five or six. God has moved in some people's lives. And I guess some people, when I said, has God provided, you should have got up and ran around the room. Amen. Because there's some things that are just supernaturally at work. Amen? Next he says, Now whatever city or town you enter into, inquire who in it is worthy, and now watch what it says here, and stay there until you go out. Now, let me just say, so he said, wherever you go, find out what's going on. Feel the atmosphere. Feel the temperature. Find out who's worthy. When you find out that there's somewhere to go, go there. But then he says, stay there you know, until you leave, until it's time to go. Amen? So there's something here. I want you to catch this. He said, wherever you go, stay until it's time to leave. Right? There's a principle of time here. What's God's timing? When all things are ready. Yeah. Well, in other words, it's not a date or a time on the calendar. Go and stay there for four days. It's like, go until it's time to leave. And when you go, there's something for you to be doing there. And so we look at this, and look, you know, this, seriously, look at, think about this. That in the body of Christ, you know, there's many who make this mistake of leaving before it's time to leave. Of going out before it is time to go out. Of, about leaving before the job is finished. Before the, what, what needs to take place actually takes place. And so when God sends you somewhere, stay there, amen, until it's time to go out. And many people do this in ministry. Okay, God's got a call on your life. And yes, they lay hands on the people. And then they commission the people. Then they go out and decide to start doing their own thing. And, then, and they end up causing a lot of problems in the mix. Like here's a small child trying to do a grown, grown man's job. Were you commissioned? Yes. But you weren't commissioned yet to go out. Are you chosen? I'm chosen, but I'm not yet ready to go out and do what I was going. Better yet, I'm out doing, but it's not time for me to quit. It's not time for me to leave. But I'm not getting anything out of it. But are you putting something in it? Because as long as you're still full, there's work for you to do. Amen. So I say this. If, if you have been constrained by the Holy Spirit, or you've been constrained by church leaders, or people who love you and, and love the kingdom, wait until there is a release. Wait until there's a godly peace. Doesn't mean everything will be peaceful. But until there's a time there's a godly peace. 
And that's where you get sent out. That's where you get moved out. There's more people, I'll tell you, along the way. That they say, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. They got five or six people saying, you're ready, you're ready, you're ready. They don't come to me and say, Pastor, I'm ready. I'm like, you're not ready. It's not time yet. It's not time yet. Wait, wait, wait on the Lord. Wait until God's timing. And those who wait succeed or leave, huh? Though sometimes people just get up and they walk out like, you're not supporting me. You're not. And you're like, no, no, you don't understand. This is not the time or the hour for that. You don't want to run out ahead of time. Be getting in a lot of trouble. Amen. So I'm not talking about just changing churches and changing fellowships. I'm talking about stay until it's time to go. This pertains to teaching. It pertains to training. And it pertains to moving out in the gifts that you are getting. You're starting to move in. Amen. So if you're being called out, or sent out, the same thing, same time. If you're being sent or called out, go. For some people, it's time to get up. It's time to move. It's time for you to use the things that, that I put inside of you. And a lot of times, people hesitate. They're not ready to move forward. They're not really ready to leave old things behind and move into the newness of life. That there's sometimes you have to be discerning of times and seasons. And you need to be around some timely and seasoned people who can help you walk through that place and through that journey. Amen. Am I speaking to anybody here today? Hallelujah. He says in verse 12, I love this. And when you go out, when you go into a household, it says, greet it. How many of y'all do that when you go to a house? Some of y'all walk in the house of the Lord, walk right past me. You know, move on. But when you walk in the house, it says, greet the house. Hallelujah. Uh, Greet the river as I come into the house. Amen. But what it's talking about here is showing love and showing honor, showing respect letting the gift of God that is in you flow out of you. That you're ambassadors to the kingdom of God. You're chosen, anointed. You've got the presence and the power of God operating on you. You, let that, you, you go someplace and you allow that gift to saturate. Amen. He says in 13, and if the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And in that verse we see there's a principle of discernment. Kind of house am I in? What kind of thing am I bringing into this house? You know, we're talking about the thing with the smile and how powerful that smile can be. I'll tell you what, but if the smile and the friendly is rejected, it may not be a house that's worthy of your presence. Amen. But it's something that we use. It's a gift that we have. It's your supernatural power. It's your superpower. Hallelujah. To come in and be able to change a room. To come and be able to change an atmosphere. Sometimes God will send you because an atmosphere or a house needs peace. And so he sends you to it. You walk in, you think, thinking, oh, this place is crazy. I don't want nothing to do with this. Sometimes you need to walk in the house and go, peace be in this house. Peace be upon this house. I love sharing this story every so often. But me and my old pastor one time, we went into a house to, to go pray for a brother. And, 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 and this guy... This guy was filled with demons. <laughs> There's all kinds of crazy stuff was going on. I, I'll, tell, I'll tell you offline sometime about it. But as we got to the house, you know, we opened the door, started up the stairs, and we greeted the house. And what greeted us back was a vicious, barking, biting dog come charging out on the stairs right at me. And now I'm, I don't do dogs. I don't do barking, biting dogs. I don't do that. That's somebody else's wheelhouse. It's not mine. But I remember when that dog came, I said, peace be on you. And the dog literally just stopped, looked back, and almost smiled. (laughs) Not an evil smile, like, okay, you can go. I remember I walked by, and then the pastor came up behind me, and that dog gnashed at him, and he said, peace be on you, and the dog would not stop. I literally turned around, would you stop playing with the dog? We got work to do up here. But I said, there's something when you walk with power, authority, and there's understanding to the power and the authority that you have. Begin to practice bringing peace with you. And speaking peace in these situations. Amen. But he says in verse 14, And whoever will not receive you, uh, nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake the dust from off your feet. Now, I'm going to bring a different spin on this, because sometimes it's like we think about that as just forget them, be done with them, have nothing to do with them. But I'm going to say there's something a little bit different about this a different approach to this. We're saying shake the dust off your feet. He's saying saying you get to operate with principles of speed, principles of efficiency, principles of holiness, of of righteousness, and and literally taking the dirt off your feet, a, a, a measure of consecration is what you're actually working with. And so if we understand what's being said, in other words, if they're going to completely reject you, don't take anything from them. Don't take any of that with you, but leave that behind and you continue to walk in the calling and the holiness in which you've been called. 
says in verse 15, he continues, he says, surely I say to you, it'll be more tolerable in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Or in other words, don't take any of that city with you, lest you be corrupted. Amen? So a lot of times, when we're out here doing the ministry work, we're out here witnessing, we're out here, here um, uh, speaking to people, and we begin to impart to them the wisdom of the kingdom of God and begin to impart to them the, the nature of Christ, the character of Christ, even the power of the kingdom of God. That, that there's times when it's like, you know what, if, if, if they're not getting it right away, don't take their stuff and put it on. You be you. You be who God called you to be. You walk in holiness. You walk in purity. You don't have to change yourself to fit a sinful culture. For you are the culture of the kingdom of God. And what did we say? The kingdom of God is coming and coming strong and it will conquer every other kingdom. You might as well not get squashed with the other kingdoms putting on their uniforms and trying to come in and do the work of deliverance, do a work of ministry with the uniform of the devil or of this world on. You, you belong to the Lord. Amen. So we set ourselves apart. We become united in Him. We are washed, we are made holy in our, our place of worship as we are pursuing and going after the deeper things with him. So going back to the text, when Jesus had gathered his disciples, very interesting when you look at the different gospels approach to it, but one thing that we see was he pulled a group of disciples together and then he chose 12 that he would spend time with. So well, like I said, it wasn't instant. There was time spent with those disciples where they were tested, where they were qualified, where they were prepared, where they were taught. And then he brought them in, and then from there, he sent them out. And he anointed them, he instructed them, he trained them, he sent them out to all of the villages. And it's interesting, if you read the text carefully, it says that he sent them out to all these places, and while they were gone, Jesus went to each one of their cities and preached the gospel. And there's something significant that I find about that. And, and this, is, this is what I catch with that. If I get about God's business, he'll take care of my business. If I go out and I begin to, to, to do the things that he's called me to do, the things I worry about or I'm concerned with, God will handle that. There's a trust factor in that. Amen? Amen. And so, like I said, the disciples did many works and many mighty works, in fact. So today I want to look at ways that we press into the maturing and the empowering process. And again, I'll bring it back up. It's, it's, it's a process. You don't achieve everything in a day. We've been through the teachings on spiritual growth and maturity. Everybody comes in as a baby. Everybody who comes into the kingdom of God, you don't know anything, and it takes time to be separated, pulled apart, to be trained, to be taught, to become learners, to grow in maturity. And then we talked about uh, two weeks ago, in the last message, we had talked about the, the circuit training, systematic circuit training, where you learn, you, 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 you begin to understand, you put it into operation, then you teach, and then you go back into learning again. And you go through this, and you become stronger and stronger and stronger in the things of God. So in other words, you're not making it up. You are speaking truth, you're revealing truth, and you're demonstrating the power. You see where I'm going with this? And so each time through, I learn it again, now I'm learning it stronger. Some of y'all are teaching, you've been teaching the EPOC group after going through it the first time, and now you're teaching it, and you're like, wait a minute, I'm getting to really understand this now. I'm getting it on a different level. And we'll go, keep going around and around and around until we are perfected, amen. And we can now present and, and work the things that we're learning, work it in our lives powerfully, amen. How many of y'all want to be moving with more power? I want the power. I want, I want to move with the speed of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I am favored. Come on, sing to me, Alicia. Praise God. Time to go to work. Hallelujah. So how do we do this? How, what, what are some of the keys and some of the principles that we can put to work? What are some of the things that we can do? Well, number one, expand your visionary endurance. Expand your visionary endurance. Endurance. So last time I spoke on this, we talked about the, the systematic training, but we also talked about having a visionary endurance. Or in other words, I endure, I keep going because I have a vision of where I'm going. I, I know I'm not there yet, but I can see into my tomorrow and I know what it is that I am becoming. How many of y'all know that you're growing and you know what you're growing up into? Okay, so how many of y'all would like to find out? Praise God. But here's the question. Do you have a vision from the... Do you have a vision... For your life from the Lord. Not something you made up, but something that he revealed to you. 
Anybody? I, got one. I don't have it. I want to get it. Praise God. The question is, can you see what your next assignment is? I might be able to see five years down the road, but can I see one year down the road? Can I see the steps that get me there? Can you see the most important thing that you must accomplish in your life? The most important thing that you must do before you leave this earth? I think that's, that's one of the biggest challenges because people are always like, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? And we got to seek God to find out what that is. That's why Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 3, and I abbreviated it, but he says, I, I, I've left the old behind and everything that is old, everything that I've accomplished, he says, I count that now as rubbish that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And so there's a, a knowledge that's taking place there. And he says, so I press on. Those are powerful words. I press, I press on, I push in, I press on that I might lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So we can look at that in terms of salvation, of eternity, of the kingdom of God, but there is a work, there is a task, there are important things that we must accomplish in this time and in this lifetime, amen. And so God begins to work on these things like he's got his hand on your life, but his hand on your life for what purpose? Amen. So he says, I press on. Ever have a day where you just need to press on? I'm like, I'm tired. I feel weak. I don't feel like doing this. But I press on. But I push on. In other words, when he's saying, no, but I press on, he's like, I, I press, but I pursue. I'm, I'm, I'm going after it. I will not be denied of what it is that God has called me to do. And, and I will not be denied of my rewards. I will not be denied of the accomplishment. Amen. And so when he says, I press on, what does it mean? Think about it. I create pressure. I put pressure on God. I put pressure on my environment. I put pressure on my life so I'm able to get these things done and accomplished. There is nothing of value that's been accomplished in this life for me that did not cause, was not caused by a creation of, of, of pressure, of drawing. And last week we were in a worship time and, and Gladys was saying, we got to pull, we got to pull on heaven, we got to pull on God. And what she's essentially saying is we have to create pressure in spiritual places so that we can force the gates open and allow the blessings of God to flow, flow, flow like a river in our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. You guys are less than enthusiastic. But let's, let's see if we can do better today. Amen. Hallelujah. Pull, create pressure. You know, and, and other things, I, I hold up under pressure. He says, I press under, I'm under pressure. But I'm going to hold up under that pressure. You know, I, I got work to do. I got I to get these things done and I got a deadline. But I realize I can do all things through Christ. I know I can get this done. And even if I don't get it done, it's not the end of the world. It's just the end of the day. Amen. But, but the pressure can be there. And you know what creates pressure? Faith. Real faith, active faith creates pressure. I said, I, I believe it, and because I believe it, it creates pressure on the environment that is around me. When you have faith for something that you really need and desire, you have a pressure that's going to be on you, that's going to cause you to pray, that's going to cause you to pursue, it's going to cause you to keep going for the things that must happen. But faith, Faith, faith is a powerful thing. You know, Jesus said this right there in Matthew chapter 10. He begins to talk to them saying, I, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And that is like for, for, for young believers, even for old believers, that's a challenge. Isn't he the prince of peace? What do you mean? He, doesn't he bring peace to the earth? And he said, in this instance, for this moment, and in this hour, he said, I'm not here to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I'm going to make a difference in what here. What's he essentially saying? Things are going to change around here. Don't you love when somebody comes in and goes, things are going to change around here. I know when I come home and my wife looks at me sternly and goes, things are going to change around here. There's pressure. Amen. And that's what Jesus was saying. And so generally he's saying that, that as, as we come and he, he's revealing the things that are about to take place. And he says, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. And the, the, the changes that we want, sometimes we want changes in our life. We want change in our community. We want change in our household. We want change in our own mind and in our own thinking. It means that we've got to create pressure. And so here's the place where Jesus is saying, these changes are going to come and it's going to hurt. <laughs> It's going to be pressure-filled, amen. It's going to come with shaking. It's going to come with pressure. You're going to have to break out of some old paradigms and break into some new paradigms. You, you understand what we mean when we say peer pressure. It means everybody wants you to do something, so you go along with it. 
But what about some Holy Ghost pressure? Where the Holy Spirit wants you to do something. And so you are compelled to go along with it. I'm compelled to get up early in the morning. I'm compelled to stay up late in the night. I'm compelled to read my word. I'm compelled to make it the small group. I'm compelled to lift my hands and worship God. Even when I don't feel like it in the natural, my spirit is crying out and say, more pressure, more pressure, more pressure on my soul so I can enter in. Hallelujah. Think about pressure. Remember Thomas? Remember Jesus died and was resurrected and he appeared to the disciples and Thomas wasn't there? I, can you poor Thomas? Like y'all saw Jesus? He came back. He's like, I don't believe it. I refuse to believe it, Thomas said. Unless I could touch the nail holes and put my hand in his side. And when he was doing that, he was making a declaration. I will believe if... He's putting pressure on the kingdom of God to prove itself, to, to show itself. And what happens? Thomas, here's my hand, here's my side. Come on, let's do this. Thomas, I'm good. I'm good. That's, that's good enough, my Lord. Hallelujah. I was just kidding. Remember what Jesus said now? He said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Amen. In other words, they have not seen, they believe, they applied their own pressure. They, 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 they applied it to themselves. And that's a, a place where many of us are. A place in our faith. Faith is, is believing without seeing. It will produce sight. It will produce the results that we're looking for, but I'm believing for it without actually seeing it. Amen. That's faith. Amen. Faith creates pressure. You know what else creates, you know what else pre creates pressure? Vision. A vision. I, I decided to see it. I decided I want it, and now there's pressure on my life to produce it. Vision produces mighty prayers that availeth much. I've got a vision for what's going to happen. I've got a vision for how things are going to turn out. And if it's not working out, it can produce a, a, a prayer that, that comes out of the inside of me that is different than, Lord, if it's your will, it's your desire, then maybe you just might. No, that's not, that's not how I pray. That not, sometimes that's how I pray, but that's when my heart's really not in it. But when there's pressure, see, the pressure will produce prayer, and my prayer produces pressure. I might be pressured by the world, and now my prayers are now going to put pressure on the kingdom of heaven to set things in right order. Amen. So we start to look at this. And so, so you know, if I, I, if I see it, but I don't obtain it, my prayer is released until it comes to pass. That's pressure-building prayer. Amen. The mighty prayer releases a vision at the same time. Or in other words, I asked a minute ago, do you have a, a vision for your life? Do you have a vision for the things that, uh, that, that God has for you? And people are, are, are hesitant at this point to even say, yes, I do. What produces your hesitation? What, what is it that's, that's producing something on the inside of you that, that, that you are, are, are timid about the, the things of God? You know, is it, but, but prayer, Lord, I just got to know. Lord, may your will be done in my life. But Lord, I need to be specific about your will. I need to know what it is. I, I want to know how to pray. And, and suddenly, in the midst of those moments, you get quiet before the Lord, and a picture will begin to be painted about your future, about the future of those around you, about the future of those that you will impact. Woo! Amen. I remember ringing myself. Hallelujah. I'm going to just throw you the bell. Hallelujah. Praise God. But to, to be able to, to, to get this, and you know, Hebrews chapter 11, they were the heroes of faith. You start looking through the, the, the heroes of faith, you know, they overcame and they, 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 they stopped the mouths of lions and all kinds of stuff that was accomplished. But, and, and we love that part. That's some good preaching right there. But then it gets to the part about those who were cut in half and sawn in two and, and they died and, and, you know, and they lived in caves and they wandered in the deserts and all that. You know, you're like, my gosh, Hebrews, Hebrews 11, it, it, it talks about they wandered in the earth. The earth was not worthy of them. Them. But in verse 39, it says, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, but God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Or in other words, I may have got a promise from God, and it's not panning out in my life. But yet I keep applying the pressure. I keep going because of a vision of that which will come to pass. And if it's not done in my lifetime, then it moves to the next generation. And then together we become perfected. Even though I wasn't there presently, 
I laid down that foundation. Guess who gets the reward? Everybody. Every, the, the, those who started and those who completed. They're everybody in the midst. That reward is ours. And that's why Abraham, that's why he was, he's considered such a father of faith because he was given the promise. And even though he sidestepped it, even though he made mistakes, how many of y'all are, are happy and, and, and grateful that we have a God of mercy? It, it may be recorded, but it's not, it's not uh, accounted to him. What's accounted to him was that he believed. And that's accounted to him righteous. And so we look and we say, you know what? Even if I messed it up, I know God can turn it around. I know God sees the end from the beginning. And so how are you going to be the father of many nations in one generation? How are you going to have so much seed, more than the sand and the, and the earth and, and the stars in the sky? How is that going to happen in one lifetime? But God said, I'm not talking about your lifetime. I'm talking about your bloodline. I'm talking about your next generation. I'm talking about your next. That I've chosen you to bring this nation into the earth. Hallelujah. And that's the kind of thing. But look, maybe that was some pressure for Abraham. Imagine all that seed, all that sand. Those are going to be your kids. He's like, I can't afford own kids. <laughs> next generation. Amen. And God is doing a work in this generation. Hallelujah. And so we're building on that which was, was given to us in the past. We're not, we're not hanging on to the past. We're stretching forward to the future because we're not going to look like the past. We're moving into a more glorious time. Amen. Woo, I feel that. Amen. I'm going to ring the bell again. We're moving into a more glorious time. Hallelujah. And there's going to be dancing. There's going to be singing. Hallelujah. There, and it, it may or may not be on key, but it won't matter because it'll be filled with joy. Hallelujah. And that's what we're working towards. That's, that's my tomorrow. And you know, I don't have to wait till tomorrow. I can live in that joy right now. I can live in the joy of the promise of God right now. Today is my day. Hallelujah. And so I'm walking it out. I'm living it out. Hallelujah. Whoo, Jesus. Hallelujah. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Put on the pressure. Some of y'all were pressured this morning because you came in and I said, hi, good to see you. Welcome to the river. You're late. You're putting pressure on me. I know, I know, I know. But it's for God's glory, you understand. I want God to be glorified in this hour. Hallelujah. Take a look at this. And, and, and we talk about vision. Take a look at this example of vision, of godly vision. The, the Apostle Peter and 2 Peter. Right? Now, now I, I want to take a little time in this. I want us to, to, to get this. Because sometimes we skip over it. We just kind of, these, sometimes there's some passages in the Bible. We just read on, read on, read around, and around until something rings our bell. Amen. But let's, let's start with the bell ringing part of this. Amen. But look at verse 13, 2 Peter 1, 13. Now, the, the apostle Peter, he's writing to them. They're, 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 they're in the dispersion. They're, 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 these are people that are put out in, in different places. And, and now Peter's coming to the end of the line. You know, the, 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 the exit door is in sight. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'm, I'm leaving this earth. And this is my way out. And this is what he says. And yes, he said, I think it is right that as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by reminding you. I just want to pause right there. As long as I'm here in this body. It says in this tent, but it means in this body. Listen, the body that I'm in right now is the body of Christ. Yes, I have my, my flesh. I'm in the body of the local church. The local church is known as the local body. Amen. And as long as I am here, you know, it, it's a good thing that for me to stir you up. I, I think it is the right thing to do to stir you up. And so I want to take some time and stir you up. He's saying to them, I have to leave. He's telling Peter, telling, I got to go soon. But as long as I'm here, I got to you're going to leave something for you. And what's he going to leave them? A vision. Oh, the old men will have dreams, but the young men will have visions. Hallelujah. And so we start looking at this particular thing. This is what you're going to do. Parents, grandparents, elders, those of you who are, have a, a few gray hairs in your beard. Hallelujah. Or lots of gray hairs in the beard. Either way. We're, we're sowing a seed that is a vision for those who are coming up behind. And what's that vision going to be? It's got to be Christ. It's got to be Christ, Him crucified. It's got to be our eternity. It's got to be not weakness, but it's got to be power. Amen. That you're not walking in weakness, you're walking in power. Hallelujah. So we press on. Verse 16, now watch the vision. He said, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. 
So in other words, everybody was out preaching, everybody had trinkets, everybody had smoke shows, everybody had the lights, everybody had all these extra things. He said, yeah, but, but we didn't come in with the extras. We came in with something potent. We came in with truth, and we're giving you the truth. Do not be deceived, do not be detracted, but you focus on the things of God. And he says, we, Peter says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You know who we was? It was him and, 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 and Peter, <laughs> and John rather, you know, talking about Peter. But it's the Mount of Transfiguration. He said we were eyewitnesses of a glory that God brought us in to show us something. Now look what he says here. He says, um, for he received, tell me about Jesus received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when we heard his voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now, now that is, that is a, a powerful place for us to pause and think about this. So in other words, why should we believe? Because Peter saw it. And, and so this power vision that he had. Now, how many of y'all know that Peter suffered? John suffered. It was John was boiled in oil and survived. Peter was crucified upside down. That's how he died. But why? Think about this for a second. Why would you suffer such a death for something that didn't happen? Why would you suffer such a death for a lie? For something that you made up? For something you saw on YouTube? Are you serious? The testimony of these men show us it's true. The resurrection is real. Christ Almighty, this is the truth. Hey, people are bringing their, their different stories and their false gods. I'm like, no, no, no. This all has to be true. This letter proves it from somebody who gave his life for the truth. Amen. But why did he do that? He did it because he had the vision. He saw it with his own eyes. Verse 19 says, Now we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. There's the kingdom of God. Amen. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Now, I just want to hold on to this for just a moment. It, when it's talking about the morning star rising in your heart, it's, it's descriptive of the manifestation of the victorious kingdom of God. So in other words, when you're in darkness, you walk in darkness, you're unenlightened, you don't have yet the glory of the kingdom of God, but the glory of God has now come upon you. That the king of glory is on the inside of you and it is conquering one thing after another thing after another thing. Aren't you glad you're not in the same condition that you were the day that you came to Christ? I, maybe, I, I know for me, I am certainly glad. I know when I came in, I had a lot of darkness. I had a lot of dark thoughts. I did a lot of stupid things. Amen. Anybody here did something stupid when you first came to the kingdom of God? I know. I know. Emma's going to say, that's a bad word. We're not supposed to say that. But she's not here. This is grown folk church. Amen. That's a kid's church. They don't say that. We say that in here. Hallelujah. I said that the other day. She corrected Michelle. Michelle said, that's stupid. She said, ah, oh, we don't say that word. We're going to say because I did some dumb things. But I'll tell you what. I thought dumb things. I spoke dumb things. I understood dumb things. But when I became a man, I put away my childish things. And so the light is, is conquering thoughts. It's conquering, it's conquering mountain after mountain after mountain until all that remains is light. That's the work of the kingdom of God. Yeah, Pastor Dave, i got some dark thoughts myself. Don't worry about that. Focus on the light. Focus on the Lord. Give it up to Him. I'll tell you what, when your thought comes against that thought that says I shouldn't be thinking that thought, you go with the thought that says that you shouldn't be thinking that thought. Amen. I'm looking for the Lord. I'm looking for the morning star. I'm looking for the white horse to come riding up into my life and to bring me into that newness of life. I, I'm looking for the next tomorrow. I'm looking for that next version of me. I am looking to be effective for the kingdom of God. That is the vision I have for my own life. It should be the vision you have for yours. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. And sometimes people come and say, you know what? I'm having a hard time, I'm having a bad thought, I'm going through this thing, going through that thing. And, and sometimes they come to us and we're, and, we're, and we're the elders of the church. We are the ones that are representing the kingdom of God. And we have to stop telling people it's normal. Just tell them there's better. Amen. Don't, don't make excuses for people where they are in sin. Don't do that. But instead, let's go forward and say, there's a better plan that God has for your life. This will pass from you. It's not shame on you and condemnation to you. No, it's there's something better for you. Stop playing in the muddy pits and start orienting yourself 
towards the, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and get your feet settled upon a solid rock and let's move forward towards being that. Amen. Get the vision that God has for your life. God, give us a vision. Get the vision that he has for your church. Get the vision that he has for your family. Get, get, get what he has for your mission field. I think Erica touched on some of this last week. And it's powerful. Like, God, what do you have for me to do? What's the work that I must get done, that I must accomplish? And, 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 and get it. And, and when you have it, write it down. Put it in the front of your Bible. Put it on a piece of paper in the front of your Bible. Put it in your notebook. Pin it on a wall somewhere. And when you get tired and when you get weary and you don't feel like going on, look at that vision. Read it out loud. Live it to the Lord and stir it up in your spirit. That's what I put pressure on your spirit. Put pressure on that vision until it comes to pass. Amen. That was, he said right here, he said, uh, go back to that verse 13. He says, as long as I'm in this tent, as long as I'm in this body, I think it is right to stir up. Say those words, stir up. To stir up, to press on, amen. And so we get it, we stir it up. That word stir up, to stir up, it means to awaken. It means to rise. It means to stir up, praise God. So we stir up the kingdom of God in your life. Stir up your gifts. Some of y'all have some incredible gifts. Begin to stir them up. And it doesn't just have to be the charismatic gifts. I'm talking about some of y'all have a gift in finance. Stir it up. Hallelujah. A gift for business. Stir it up. A gift to be able to communicate with children. Stir that up. A, a gift to be able to communicate with adults. Stir up your gifts. Stir up your anointing. Stir up your belief. Stir up your faith. Or in other words, don't waddle. You know, I, I felt when I came in this morning that there was a, a, a spirit of discouragement, a spirit of heaviness. That's why we took the first 15 minutes of service and began to pray and change the atmosphere and get ready for the coming of God. Hallelujah. And this is times, there's things we got to do. We got to go sometimes. Amen. Sometimes that's what you got to do in your house. We're going to stir up this whole house. I'm going to wake this whole house up. Oh, don't wake the kids. Wake the kids. Hallelujah. They need to get up for Jesus. They need to, they need to be excited. They can't go to church all like that. No, we're going to the house of the Lord. We're going we're gonna to dance. We're going to rejoice. And you know, worship ain't going to be. You're going to have to deal with Alicia and Gladys and Carmen and Liani now. You've got to deal with her too. Because I saw your face during worship. She looking at them people. I saw that. you good. Hallelujah. You know, good. No, she wasn't looking at me. Hallelujah. But you could if you wanted to. I'm down. Let's go for the deeper things of God. Amen. Here's what happens when you get stirred up. Here's what happens when you get excited about it. What it does is it begins to attract to you the help that you need. Both the help that you need, both in the natural and in the spirit. When you get stirred up, you get worked up, you get, get yourself ready for that. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, I know some of y'all starting to teach some classes and stuff, and you might feel, I'm, I'm not prepared. I, I really don't want to do it before you start. Take a walk around the parking lot. Begin to stir up your spirit. Begin to stir up the gift of God that's on the inside of you. That's what, that's what, that's what the apostle Paul told Timothy. Begin to stir up the gift that's on you by the laying on of my hands. What did he do when he laid hands? He imparted the kingdom of God into him. And so that the gift of God, the virtue of God is now set upon you. My God. Hallelujah. Whoo. How am I doing? All right. Praise God. I'm looking at the clock. And okay. Back to the notes. Hallelujah. Vision will pull you back when you're about to quit. Vision will pull you back when you're about to do something that's going to cause irreparable damage to your walk, irreparable damage to the course and to your destination. You know, Habakkuk 2 says this, and you don't, I don't have a slide for it, but it's, he says, write the vision and make it plain that those who read it will run with it. So you've got to write the vision. You need to make it plain. So we have a vision statement for the church in the back of the building. That's why we repeat it over and over again. So you know who we are, what we're about. And if you decide to be a part of the vision, you get to run with that vision. Amen. Components of vision. My vision. I'm going to give you some components of my vision. My vision is to be a righteous man in my old age. Amen. In other words, I want to get old. And when I get there, I want to be righteous. Amen. My vision is to be a good husband. I'm getting there. Amen. And a good father. Hallelujah. Both in the natural and in the spirit. Amen. My, my vision is to leave an inheritance and a strong legacy behind me. So in other words, when I go, people will say, you know what? He glorified God with his life. You know, even if they don't believe what I believe, at least they can look and say, well, at least he believes what he really believes. You're not a hypocrite. But leaving a legacy. He was a good man. He, he left a, a, a legacy behind. Amen. 
My vision, I got a vision as a minister and a vision as a counselor. I want to see people succeed for the kingdom of God. I want jewels in my crown when I arrive. Hallelujah. These are the kinds of things that I look for. My vision is to operate in the prophetic with increasing accuracy, authority, and timing. Hallelujah. Those are the goals that I have set. It's the vision that I have. Not goals that I've set, but these are the things that God has spoken to me in my prayer time, in my quiet time. God began to reveal some things to me at times. And I'm like, why? Why are you showing me this? I, I don't, why, do we, why do I have to know all this? this is, and God begins to say, this is the reason why. Because this is what you will do. And if you don't start working in this now, you're going to miss it down the line. That's why. God be speaking to some people. Amen. We want to impact generations, impact the community, impact the nation. And all these things, not to glorify myself and not to glorify my name, but to glorify God. Yes. To glorify his holy name. You know, I, I love when I can walk in the room and somebody says, thank God, instead of, oh God. Amen? <laughs> and leadership. We learn and impart the mission of Christ in everyone who is open and ready to receive. Then when they get quit, then when they get tired and they want to quit, the vision speaks and endurance kicks back in. I don't know, I don't want to do this no more. I, I got all this stuff going on in my life and, and all these things. But he said, but you realize that this is part of your future? Mm -hmm. Do you realize that this is training for your next thing? Do you realize that if you quit this time through, that you're going to be set back two or three years to the thing that you're actually trying to do? Do you reckon? I mean, and, and what's happening now? You're beginning to speak vision. A lot of times I'm called upon to do things by people who are further down the road than me and they can begin to speak to me about things. I'm like, look, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. I'm not gifted to it. I'm not anointed to it. But then something inside me says, but if you're looking at me and that's what you think I can do, I can do it. I, I'll, I'll figure it out. And then what do you do? I pray and stir up the Holy Spirit and I ask God, help me do this. Now, spark life on the inside of me. I don't, I don't want to look foolish and I don't want to bring anything of, of, that's not glorious to your name. Amen. Just real quick, Hebrews 10.35, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, that after you have done the will of God, you will receive the promise. You have need of endurance. I got a word for you today. Two words, don't quit. Don't give up. If God has called you to it, it's possible. Amen. Pursue Him, pursue His ways, and hold on to the vision. If it doesn't work out today, I got a whole nother day tomorrow. If I couldn't finish it by 8 o'clock, I, I could get it by next, 8 o'clock next week. I'll get it done. But don't quit. Don't give up. You're not less than. Matter of fact, you're made for more. You're built for better. Hallelujah. You have the kingdom of God growing on the inside. But I tried it before and I failed. That's because you had a little bit of the kingdom. Now you got more of the kingdom. Try again. Now you have more. Try again. And you keep going until you succeed at what God has called you to. So number one, expand your visionary endurance. Expand your vision, and you will increase in endurance. Amen. Number two, I love this. I probably won't get to three, so let's just do two. Hallelujah. Add to your faith strength. Add to your faith strength. Now, let me explain that a little bit. Now I understand we are walking into a new day that we're entering into the young man stage. You know, a lot of times I'm, I'm writing notes or reading things. I just keep putting the, the, the letters together. Y-M means young man. We're entering into a young man stage. And so remember, we read this out of uh, Second John. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. I have written to you because you are strong. I have written to you because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome, overcome, overcome the wicked one. This should be ingrained in our heart and our mind and our spirit. I'm strong in the Lord. That when I feel weak, I know I am strong. I'm strong in Christ. My strength is building. That I am not the same as I was before. Yes, I got run around before, but I'm not being run around anymore, at least not in the same clip, because now I'm strong in the things of God. Hallelujah. I'm entering into a place of strength. So in 2 Peter 1.5, we're going to go there in just a moment, but it says, add to your faith virtue is what it says. Add to your faith virtue. Virtue means mighty, powerful, valiant, strength. Literally, it means, you know, we think virtue is like cute. It's not cute. It's macho. Hallelujah. It's, it's powerful. Amen. It's valiant. And that, that is to add to your faith, valiant. Amen. Now, just reading from Second Peter, 
I'll stop reading from one and we'll catch up. He's, no, actually, let's just go right down to verse 5. Hallelujah. He says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. So it starts with faith. Everybody's been given a measure of faith. We understand the word of God tells us that we have some faith. Already started. My first day in the kingdom of God. Well, what do you have? Nothing, but I got faith. That's how I got in here. Amen. But I'm coming in now, but he says, now add to that valiance. Add to that endurance. Add to that strength. Add to that, think about this, that, that word meaning that manliness, that strength. Think about this. I'm adding to my faith lifting power. Amen. Lifting power. So we look, it says, you know, add to your faith virtue, right? So another adding to our faith strength. Now think about this for a second. I have faith. Earlier in the service, we were sharing how God's been good to us and things we're expecting God to do. Now, we add to our faith ability. Bring it to pass. Call out for it. Cry out to it. Now think about this. In the Bible, oftentimes in the presence of Jesus, people were healed and Jesus said to them after they were healed, he said, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. Amen. So is it unreasonable to think that I can have faith to heal myself? Oh, I have to go and have people pray for me. Or is there faith to heal yourself? Is there faith to break through you and God? Amen. Does that make sense? I'm in your faith. I'm adding to it lifting power. So how do I do that? I stir up my faith. I now rally it around. It's not like I just want God to do it. I've got scriptures. I'm, I'm looking them up. I'm reciting them. I'm learning them. I'm putting them upon the wall. I'm putting pressure on heaven and saying, my faith, my faith. I'm pushing through the crowds. I'm, I'm the, the throngs of people so I could touch the hem of the garment of Jesus and receive that that I'm going for and that that I'm looking for. So it's like, not shame on you because you haven't gotten it yet. It's keep going. Keep running. Keep going for it. Look for it. Look for the opportunity. See how others are doing it. So if they can do it, I know I can do it because I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. But I know I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You can have faith to break your debt. I know a lot of people are wrestling with debt. I mean, it's, it's like the normal American thing today. But by faith, you can break debt. God will give you ideas, opportunities, put destiny helpers in your path. I mean, all these things will come to pass and they can be released by faith. Amen. Faith to set the captives free. I like that, Isaiah 61. You know, to set the captives free, to heal the broken heart. I can heal my own broken heart. I can break out of my own chains. And when I've learned to do that, I can help other people do the same thing. I can pray their doors open. I can pray the chains broken off of them and they will be healed and they will be delivered. Amen. But it takes strength. It takes courage. It takes, you know, when Israel came out of the wilderness, they were coming into the next season. You know, Moses had brought them through into the wilderness and, and brought them through and out the other side, but he can't leave with them. And, and so now they're entering into their next season. They're getting ready to cross over into the promised land. Moses dies in the process of all of this, but now Joshua is being raised up to take Moses' place. Actually, he's not even taking Moses' place. Joshua is rising up to take the place God called him to, to lead them into the promised land. He was moving into his next as God's chosen leader. So look at this. God gives Joshua a vision. He speaks to him. And he says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. God is speaking to Joshua. Clearly, not like he's getting ideas. No, he says, as I was with Moses, the miracles, the signs, the things Moses did, I'll be with you. When the people acted up, God never forsook Moses. Amen. But he was always with Moses. Hallelujah. He says, everywhere your foot treads, I give to you. And, and that, how would you like to hear that word from God? Wherever your foot goes, that will be yours. You'd be like knocking on mansion doors, talking about, can I come in for a minute? <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about your solar. <laughs> I'd like to talk you about the Lord, can I come in? But just about everywhere you go, that that land was given to you. Amen. And he says, your ways will be prosperous and you will have good success in everything you do. Your ways will be prosperous and you will have good success. So what is Joshua getting from God? A vision. A vision for success. 
No, he didn't mention giants or anything. He just said, go get what's there. But what did he say? You can have all these things if you obey my laws. And then he gave him the commandment. What's the commandment? Now remember, be strong and courageous. What did he tell him? Be strong. Wait a minute. But before we get to courageous, let's talk about being strong. He didn't tell him just have courage. How many of you know some people with courage and no brains? Don't have, the, don't have the strength to back up the courage. They get knocked around. They get beat up. They get left by the side of the road. But yeah, they keep coming. But strength comes in, opens the door, and backs up. You know, a lot of times we get this vision, you know, and, and I, I know there's a lot of pictures and stuff, and you see like the little kitty cat and the big lion behind him, right? And so the kitty cat thinks he's got all that power and all that, and in the meantime, it's the, the big lion behind him. See, I want to take that vision and reverse it. It's God that goes before us and vanquishes our enemy. See, we come behind him. It's not him coming behind us. See, sometimes, see, we get follow the leader wrong sometimes in the kingdom of God. We go where sent. We go where led. See, we're not leading the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's leading us. And when we can get this in right order, there's power that will be released. And so here's the interesting thing, though. He says, if only obey my commandments and be strong and courageous. And so why was he telling them to be strong and courageous? I love this. Why? Because observing the law requires strength and courage. Observing the commandments of Christ. Living, uh, the, living in, as a kingdom citizen requires strength and courage, especially today where many people are against what we're doing. You've got to be able to stand up in character, stand up. All, all the world right now is not too much love in Christians, even though we're bringing the light into the world. But we're upsetting their existing systems that have been here for generations. Oh, my gosh. Hallelujah. So we're making trouble. Amen. Good trouble for the kingdom. Hallelujah. Bringing it forward. You know, last week, I was, uh, during the week, I was teaching a lesson about uh, uh, breaking hesitation, about hesitation in people's lives uh, to move forward in the truths of the things of God. And I was saying that one of the big problems why people hesitate is because they're stuck in old paradigms. And I was saying this about old paradigms. What do we have to do to get rid of these old paradigms, these old mindsets? What do we have to do? We have to have our minds renewed, not to be conformed to this world, but to be reformed in our minds. Amen. And so what is the, 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 the quote that I love that, that's been resounding in my spirit was changed takes guts. Change, to change out of something old. But I've been doing this for the last 20 years and I've been building my kingdom. on Listen, that's old. Now you're stepping forward into the new. It takes guts to change hearts. It takes guts to change your mind. Changing the mind takes guts. It takes grace. It takes faith. And it takes help. You're not called to do this thing alone. You're called to do it with the help of the Lord. And by the way, the help of the Lord comes in the form of people who are ahead of you in faith. It can come from a donkey, it can come from outside, but there's help inside the kingdom of God. There are brothers and sisters who are ahead of you who can help you navigate these dark places, these difficult places. And so sometimes we just got to be able to ask for help. Amen. To be able to say, honestly, help is on the way. My God, hallelujah. I've written into you. I've written to you because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. He said, I've written to you because you are mighty, because you are powerful, because you are valiant. That is what that means. I've written to you because as a young man in the spirit, this is who you are. You know the word of God. It abides on the inside of you. That you are, you are made, not just made for more, you are made for victory. You are made as a conqueror, more than conqueror in all these things. To realize this is who you are. You're not a loser. You're not, you're not coming in last place. You're not riding in the caboose. You're not the tail. You're the head. You are called into something greater. And so we have to walk like something greater. Christian, lift your head. Lift your head up. Don't walk with your head down and talk about what a loser you are and the people around you and all that stuff. And rebuke that in Jesus' name. So no losers in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, by definition, is victory. It's victory. That's why we're singing out on Wednesday night. Me and Michelle was anyways. But the worship team's going to learn it. Praise God. We're going to walk in a place of victory. Amen. Well, the last point. Yeah, okay. I'm going to do it anyways. We talked about expanding your vision, right? We, we talk about adding strength to your faith. But here's the last point is this. You have to confront and overcome fear. You have to confront and overcome fear. Fear is why everybody hesitates. Nobody hesitates based on wisdom. 
Most people are hesitating based on fear. What happens if I take a step forward? You know, last week, Eric was talking about the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. And maybe more accurately, what she was saying is the relationship of the sheep towards the shepherd. And isn't it interesting today? I mean, you look at stuff online. You see things that people putting out there. And, and today's social and political landscape, being called a sheep is a derogatory term. It's used to characterize people as weak and easily deceived and just followers of the crowd. And isn't it just like the world to take something that God uses as a holy and sanctified thing and then try to turn around and make it into a negative? But listen, one of the benefits of being in Christ and being counted as one of his sheep is there's a certainty of direction and an absence of fear. When you are a sheep of the Lord, my sheep, they know my voice. They will not follow the, the, the voice of a stranger to be able to walk that out and say, listen, as a believer, I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. I may not have all the details, but I, I know I'm moving towards a better end. Amen. And then comes this place and says, listen, it's an absence of fear. And I say an absence of fear. It's not like you will never be afraid, but, fr but fear will not be debilitating to you. It's not going to stop you from moving. It's not going to cause you to hide away and, and, and put your, your measly talent in the earth and dig it up later on. Remember, that was, a, that was the problem with the parable of talents. But we get to overcome fear. We get to, 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 to go into a, a better place. Amen. Psalm 23 begins with the words, The Lord is my... The Lord is my shepherd, you know. And I started to look at I'm not going on this rabbit trail right now, but I love this. Is that, you know, if you take a look at what that actually means, it's saying, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my companion. The Lord is my grazing field. It's, it's, it's where I go for my substance. It's where I go. I know that I am safe and I know I will be fed, that this is who God is to me. God is my, my shepherd, amen. But if you go to verse four, it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will not have fear. It says, why? Because you are with me. Now, no, we, we, we go through this sometimes. We, we go through Psalm 23 because we don't know what else to do sometimes. We read it at the funeral and everything because we understand that this is really talking about our projected end in the Lord. Amen. But we look at it right here. It's like, you are with me. Why, why are you not afraid? Why are you not falling apart in the midst of the situation? But God, God's with me. He said, was it uh, uh, Isaiah 43? It says, that, you, know, you are mine. You are mine. I'll, I'll be with you in the waters. I will be with you in the fire. You won't even smell like smoke, says the Lord. He says that, that so he says, I'm not afraid. This is David saying, for you are with me. Now it says, and your rod and your staff give me comfort. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Now I, I love the rod and the staff. The rod and the staff give me comfort. What's the rod for? To whoop your behind, Absolutely. To, to, to beat down the enemy, but when necessary, to bring some things into your life to understand God is a good father. He chastens those whom he loves. Amen. And, and, and the staff, what's the staff for? A, identifies him as a shepherd. B, actually, it's for guidance. It's, it's to guide the sheep, to put them in the right direction. Hold the staff up, they can see me. Feel the staff, they know the rod's coming. And they'll follow the right direction. And that brings us comfort. Like I said, get behind the shepherd. Don't run out in front. And never try to bite the shepherd. Amen. We have a special place for sheep who bite shepherds. Amen. <laughs> You're not covered by the rod and the staff unless you stand under the rod and the staff, which is God's righteousness. Come in under his righteousness, you have nothing to fear. Walk in righteousness, you have nothing to fear. And in verse 3, he says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Courage. We talked about strength, let's talk about courage. Courage means that in spite of the fact that I might have some fear, I'm going to keep going. Though things may not work out the way I, I think they should, I believe in what I'm doing, I believe in the direction I'm going in, and so courage keeps me moving, keeps me going forward. And here's, I, I want to just catch this principle of truth. Courage is revealed in the face of fear, but fear loses its power in the quiet places with the Lord. So I could say this. If I go out on the battlefield, 
my courage might be tested when I face an enemy. But it was not established when I faced the enemy. My courage was established during my training. I learned to be courageous in the power and the presence of God. I learned to be courageous when I studied my Bible. I learned to be courageous when I, when I was walking behind some of those people who mentored me in my faith, who discipled me. That those, I learned to be courageous then, but then my courage was tested when I moved out. Does that make sense? So it's not like just jump off and see what happens. But no, like David when he faced down Goliath. Man, they put all that armor on. He took Saul's spear and he threw, I, I can't work with this. This stuff's heavy. It's not, I can't be, be proven with this. He said, just let me get some stones on the sling and we'll go take care of business. And so powerfully killed the giant, then ran down the field after promising the giant that he was going to kill him and take his head off. He's like, I don't even have a sword. I'll use his. They lopped the giant's head off. Hey! Powerful. Strong and courageous. Fear loses its power in the quiet places with God. If you're afraid, go pray. If, 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 if prayer isn't working, worship the Lord until it dissipates. Amen. I'm going to close with this, but I want to go back quickly to Matthew 10.1 when Jesus commissioned his disciples, the one we opened up with. When he had called the 12 disciples to himself, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sickness and disease. The first thing Jesus did was to give them power. But the power over unclean spirits is, is a, a different thing altogether. And I had to think, why would he give them power over the unclean spirits, the first thing? Because they were going into dark territories and perhaps the first place they had to deal with unclean spirits and cast them out was in their own lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they would be facing down dark things. And you know, unclean spirits have a way. What are their name? Sickness, disease, injury, lies, fear, have a way of speaking to us when we are starting to move out to do the things of God. First thing he did was give them power over their own thoughts. Gave them power over their own fears. I can only imagine they're walking into the village and as they're walking, I rebuke you, you spirit of fear. I have, I have what God has told me to have. What are we going to eat? Don't worry, we're going to eat. I don't have to worry about that. Food will be provided in the name of Jesus. What if they reject you? Now, there's a house in this town that is worthy. He said, find the house that is worthy and that's where I must go. And they begin to deal with these things until they begin to see the real power of God. Imagine they walked in because he told them. He told them to raise the dead. Imagine that. Like that's, hey, I want you to go into uh, a Haverhill Center. Find a dead body and raise it. <laughs> that can't be the Lord. Somebody died right there in the supermarket. I know what to do. In the name of Jesus, rise. I don't know what happened to the guy at the eight beautiful. Wasn't that what happened right there? I mean, he, they're walking up and, and the man looks at them uh, expecting to get something in there. There, and, they look, and, 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 and he's like, you know, give me something, give me something. This is silver and gold we don't have. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And they took him by the hand. And when they took him by the hand, there was an impartation of the grace of God and the kingdom of God that the man didn't just stand up and crawl up. He leapt up, my God, and became a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ powerfully. So much, so you got to love when there's a good miracle that sends the preachers to jail. Hallelujah. Good day to get locked up. Hallelujah. For the glory of God. Hallelujah. Beyond the power gifts and the instruction to be powerful witnesses, there was a warning that also took place about persecutions and divisions, the principles of, of the fear of the Lord and, and the rewards of, of, of preaching. But, but, but power has its purpose. Amen. The power has a purpose to keep us moving forward. We want to see people healed and delivered. How many of you want to see some people healed and delivered? I'm tired of seeing people sick. I'm tired. I, I want to see the impartation of grace and seeing the people who have been under this, this, this heavy hand and see them get set free. Amen. But relief is not the goal. Relief is not the goal. The kingdom of God is the goal. Hallelujah. When the kingdom comes and comes upon you and draws near you, then there is healing and there is deliverance. Sometimes we're praying the wrong thing. Praying, God, give me relief. And he says, no, pray for the kingdom. Pray for the kingdom of God to be imparted. Amen. When the kingdom is in you, you become an instrument of wisdom and miraculous power. 
an instrument of wisdom and miraculous power. Amen. So I'm going to take a few moments now as we close. I hope you all were blessed by this. Amen. Let's pray. Let's, let's usher in the Holy Spirit in the place of our closing. Amen. As we think about this word, as we think about the place where we are, my God, I pray, God, expand our vision today. Give us the vision. Sometimes we're confused and we have a vision, but we don't know that that's God. We don't understand that that's what's happening. And God continues to speak and we tend to operate in a place of confusion. But today I say, Lord, expand our vision. Give us vision. Give us sight. Give us the insight. Give us the things that we need. Hallelujah. I'm praying today for the virtue of strength. I'm praying for might. I'm praying for valiance. To add to your faith, virtue. Virtuous strength. Strength to, to endure the hard seasons. And, and even better yet, the, the strength of God that doesn't just help us to endure, but that gives us the ability to prevail. That gives us the ability to walk stronger. That gives us the ability to overcome fear, where fear can be a debilitating factor in our own lives. That right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the kingdom of God that will come and crush our hesitation, that will come and crush our, our false belief systems, uh, things that will come and break up the old paradigms and break up the fallow ground that we're able to operate as sons of God, as the children of God, that this is our time and it's our season and it is our hour that I, I pray in the name of Jesus that every distress dissipates in the name of Jesus. I come against discouragement now in the name of Jesus.